I would like to welcome both people. 30 seconds. Okay, I'm going to welcome everyone who is here and then we'll uh, then I will get the nod and we will be live. So um Okay, so I would like to welcome everyone to the uh, Faculty of Social Studies in Brno, Masaryk University. Uh, my name is Kateřina Friedrichová. I am the Assistant Professor at the Department of International Relations and European Studies at this faculty. And uh, I will be moderating the discussion that we are going to have uh, about the Ukrainian war. I also welcome everyone watching us uh, on, I think it's YouTube, isn't it? Or on the stream that we are also sending. So we're also welcoming the viewers. Uh, just a technical uh, issue. We will open it to the questions from the, from the audience at some point. And at that moment, uh, I will always ask you to uh, speak loudly and let me repeat the question because we uh, the technical uh, stuff doesn't allow us to have a rowing microphone so we'll have to do make do this way and with that I would like to welcome our panel it's kind of impromptu panel actually which as uh, we are fortunate to have um, uh, three gentlemen they both come from uh, the United States and they happen to teach their courses at this moment, uh, our faculty. So it's both uh, me welcome, it, welcome, and also thank you for all the courses that you are offering, because I thought I might actually cite the courses that you are teaching, because I think they are kind of suggestive of uh, what we are going to talk about, because in fact, the Ukrainian war is going on a third month, so I thought we might not start with the beginning, but give a broader spectrum of um, issues that are related to the situation. So I would like to welcome on my left, nearest left, as Dr. Thomas Darl Young, who teaches military transformation in Central Europe. Um, then next to him is Professor James Stuart Richter, Richter? Yes. who teaches memory of wars between Russia and Central and Eastern Europe. And further, uh, there is Dr. Schuyler Foster. Schuyler Foster. Okay, Schuyler. Okay. That's where it gets. Okay. So Schuyler Foster. Um, and he teaches security systems and actors and also US politics and Americans changing global role. So actually I thought all these uh, courses suggest that you have some affinity to Central Europe and uh, that's why we get you here. So I'll let you actually introduce yourself and uh, Tom told me he had some disclaimers, so that's the time where you make it and then we'll get to this. So, so my qu the question is introduce yourself and uh, actually if you could give us a small few sentences, how did you actually uh, appear here in the Central Europe? How did you end it up here? And I will start with you, Tom. Okay. Right. Tom Young. Um, I am a uh, senior lecturer at the Naval Postgraduate School. Uh, Monterey, California, just south of San Francisco. Um, I have to state uh, emphatically a disclaimer that nothing I say reflects the policy or positions, the opinions of the Department of Defense, the Defense Security Cooperation Agency, the Naval Postgraduate School, and at the request of my youngest son, I don't speak for my youngest son either. <laughs> so this is only my, uh, my, my own um, uh, irresponsible views informed by many, many years in this part of the world. Um, how I came here is I've been working uh, Central and Eastern Europe since returning to my home state of California in 2000. Um, I've worked in every MOD and general staff in the, uh, Central and Eastern Europe uh, for the last tw tw almost 25 years, uh, working for the Department of Defense uh, trying to affect um, defense reform, defense transformation, dare I suggest, importing you know, the NATO Army model, so to speak, uh, with varying degrees of, of success. 
Um, so I'm here because uh, Zenenik asked me to do this last year, and um, I'm on a on leave status, so from here I'll go to the Baltic Defense College where I will mentor the uh, higher command studies course and then I'll end up a couple weeks in, um, in Łódź in Poland at the university as a visiting fellow. And then I'll go back to my day job, which is working for you safely with F-16s in this part of the world. So it's good to be here. Thank you, Katarina. Thank you. Um, Jim, could you give us your take yes. on this issue? <laughs> Hi, oh, just who I am, right? Yes. That's the issue. Okay, uh, I think I know that one. Um, so my name is uh, Jim Richter. I'm here from Bates College, a small college in Lewiston, Maine. Uh, I did my graduate work at Berkeley way back in uh, 1989. Um, my research area has pretty much always been Russia. Uh, I did uh, my thesis, my dissertation, and my book was on uh, Soviet domestic politics during the Cold War. Um, and since then, I have been looking at uh, Russian civil society and um, as well as how Ru U.S. efforts to build civil society has, has worked or not worked in, in Russia. My interest in Central Europe, I've always been interested in Central Europe, um, but Russia really spent, took most, much of my time. I have found in the last 10, 15 years that it has been difficult to study civil society in Russia and, and not necessarily very pleasant. The last trip I've been was 2012 where I had to tell people I wasn't a foreign agent, well I was, you know, where I was often seen as a foreign agent where people were interviewing KGB, I mean FSB people after I left and stuff like that. So I didn't want to do that anymore and so I came to do, uh, the Czech Republic, which I've always been interested in. I got a Fulbright here in 2019, and I've been teaching a little bit ever since. So. Thank you. And now, uh, Sky, if you could. Yes. Uh, thank you, Katarina, for putting this together and moderating this, and, and Aaron for um, making all the dials and uh, work. Um, I'm Sky Forrester. I first came to um, uh, Brno in January 2017 as a Fulbright. Uh, teaching in the Department of Political Science. Um, was here for five months, loved it. Um, long association with this part of the world. I was career Air Force. Um, started my career in another small war in Southeast Asia a long time ago. Um, uh, taught at the Air Force Academy and was able to get my doctorate at Oxford uh, along the way. Um, and then my career really went into political military policy, focusing on European security and NATO issues. Uh, so I worked at NATO in the mid-80s. Um, and then I had the wonderful opportunity to go to Vienna in 1990 and spend uh, time, A, negotiating, helping negotiate this Conventional Forces in Europe Treaty, and then spend the next three years trying to hold it together. Um, and then um, uh, retired from the Air Force, and then uh, about... Uh, 12 years ago, went back to teach at the Air Force Academy as a civilian. Uh, I'm now emeritus in the uh, uh, political science department at the Air Force Academy. My uh, focus has been on European security, NATO, and arms control for um, more years than than I'd like to think. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. So, you can, as you can see, there is quite a lot of um, experience, if not expertise, Quoting you, Tom, uh, that uh, there, uh, there, so, so your questions actually in, at the end might be quite wide ranging because some of the things that we kind of learn as uh, the modern history, you were actually making the history in many ways, Sky, listening to you. <laughs> and, uh, it's just the gray hair, Katarina. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's, uh, but actually, that's actually connecting us to whatever we are learning as a, something that, um, you lived it, so I think that actually uh, really counts and it's uh, appreciated here. Uh, so actually, as, uh, when we started to put uh, this panel on, I asked you to, if you could start with what's your pet peeve. I'm going to, for the non-English speakers, pet peeve is something that annoys you. So my question was, what annoys you about the um, and the media and the commentariat and all the discussion. What are your pet peeves about the war 
in Ukraine. And actually, you can uh, choose any of those that we uh, were discussing via email, and then we'll pick up on them later. So if you, I would start with, uh, start with Sky and go back right. to me. Well, my, it was an easy question to ask because I've been talking about this with my students and um, talking about it with people back home because there's a narrative that I'm sure everyone here has heard, uh, and that is um, voiced most prominently, perhaps, by John Mearsheimer about, what, two or three weeks ago, that basically said the West is the reason why. We're, it is our fault that, you, that uh, Russia has, uh, that Putin has, has, has invaded Ukraine. And I mean, I had a colleague of mine back in Colorado Springs um, talk about the America's evangelical zest for bringing all these countries into the West when we should have just let them be. And, um, and in a sense, I was there. I mean, as early, I mean, the Warsaw Pact had not even ended formally in early 1990 when um, particularly Poles, Czechs, in that case Czechoslovakia together still, uh, from Hungary delegations that we were working with uh, in Vienna were already eager, pleading, when this is all over, we need to be part of the West. And it was... Again. Uh, again. again. Yeah. Um, and actually the United States was reluctant, as were most NATO allies, reluctant um, to enlarge the alliance. Um, and it wasn't until a couple years later, and you know, famous meeting with between President Clinton and Vaclav Havel and Lech Walesa, um, that basically convinced the U.S. administration. And then it took another year or two before the Defense Department would go along with it um, to convince U.S. policy to change U.S. policy from being against it to for it. So this, and the alliance has not enlarged to the east since the entry of the Baltics, and that was, this is 2022, that was 18 years ago. So somehow to say, I'll stop on this point, but somehow to say that 18 years on, um, which is the age of some of my students, uh, 18 years on, somehow Putin now decides he really wants to do something about it, and it's our fault, uh, which I think is, is disingenuous to the extreme. But I'll stop on that one. Okay, and I, I'm sure we'll get to it again in the next round. So, Jim. Yeah, so, uh, and I'm going to comment on the U.S. Uh, media and commentary because I'm not really familiar with it, what it's going on now. But everywhere they talk about how the whole world is sort of arrayed against Putin. And uh, that clearly is not the case. If you just look at the amount of humanity, I would say that most of the world is kind of neutral. If you look at China and India, uh, at various ways, China is less neutral than India, or Brazil, or Nigeria, South Africa. Um, they're, they're trying very carefully not to take sides in some ways. Um, also, I think it's really, uh, and I think we, as the Americans, have to realize that and have to think about that and what that means and how we proceed as a result. Uh, second, um, I also have noticed in, in the US and in other places that there tends to be a demonization of not only uh, the Russian government, which is well worth demonization but uh, for what they have done, but also the Russian culture and Russian people. And I find that troubling for a lot of reasons but for the most practical reason is that Russia's not gonna go anywhere. It's still gonna be a huge landmass, and it's still gonna have a huge nuclear arsenal. And uh, it's still gonna have a lot of oil. And so the question is, is how do we deal with that after this is over? And it depends on how it ends. I have no real, I have no recommendation now. But to, to just say we're going to um, cut them off or everything means that they're almost certainly going to have to go more to China um, because there's no other place to go. And China would love to have their energy. So that's not a problem. Um, and finally, uh, as part of that, I, I actually like Joe Biden a lot um, as a human being from what I know of him, which is extremely, I mean, that's what I see in the press and one brief encounter. But um, I do wish that he would tone down the rhetoric a bit 
just because, not that I disagree with what he's saying, but that this kind of feeds into the image of the US in much of the world that it has an interest in sort of maintaining its own hegemony and uh, in some cases, in some places, as kind of a revisionist power trying to export its, uh, its, its vision of the world everywhere regardless. And I, I just think if he said, we have evidence and it would be good if the international community looked into this with the UN, that would be much better than if he said the US has this or he has this opinion speaking from his position as the head of the United States. Okay, thank you. And Tom? Right, I have um, three points. Um, the first point is apropos um, Sky's point about this idea that somehow um, the causus belli for this conflict is, um, is NATO. Um, I could not disagree more with this thesis, whether it's expounded by you know, reactionary nationalistic press in the US or, or political scientists. I'm an economist, so by definition, I don't have any time for political scientists. <laughs> because of course, they're wrong more than us and they're the only people wrong more than us. <laughs> and we're all wrong quite a bit. But on a, on a more serious point, and I do respect good political scientists because they're modest like good economists. Um, I had the distinct pleasure at, be at, to be at history, watching history as I told my students the other day. I was in um, Brussels for, uh, I was working for the army staff and I was at NATO in spring 1990 and I was having, we were all trying to figure out what the hell was going on in Europe and which way it was gonna go. And um, I was, we were drugged down by the political officer at the US mission because I forgot the name of the committee, Sky will remember, but the, 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 the secretary general had, uh, had received a letter from Havel. And the letter said, you know, things are changing in Europe, we're democratizing and uh, the Czechoslovak Republic would very much welcome the opportunity to engage in a dialogue with NATO so we can discern how, what sort of relationship we could have with them. Now at the time, I think we were, nine, we were 18 and I, I had the distinct pleasure of sitting in a room with 18 diplomats who, ha who ha had no idea how to respond. We had never had this thing, this sort of thing ever right. before. We had no idea which is amazing for diplomats because it, they, they're happy to talk without saying anything. But we were really, the, you could tell the delegations from the, imp, from the, from the missions, the, the individual countries were trying to figure out what the hell do we say? We don't want to alienate you know, the Soviets. You know, we don't want to encourage the, you know, the Czechoslovaks to do something that might be precipitous, but at the same time, we can't say no if we're going to you know, stay with our, with our values. Um, and so this idea that somehow you know, that we, are, we are behind this, some sort of cabal, some sort of conspiracy is really quite ahistorical, yeah. which you would expect from, from a very narrow political scientist, not Sky. Um, Ukraine, my pet peeve. Very quick background. I spent 12 years in and out of Kyiv uh, running the largest defense reform project um, funded by the Department of State and then later funded by the Department of Defense. So I know the defense institution rather well. My team set up the Joint Operations Command. We were setting up this Special Operations Command and we were trying, at the time we were trying to crack the logistics problem which my students and I talked about yesterday, the big challenge of that. 2010 happens, Yanukovych comes in and everything is shut down. Absolutely everything. They shut down the JOC, they shut down all of our efforts and we are where we are. Now, what do I see now? And I think this is important from a US policy perspective, is that the Ukrainian army is, l is largely engaged in the east. Um, I think what you've seen in the north, and I think even part of what you're seeing down around Mariupol, I think what you see there is, is really not just the territorial defense forces, which have self-generated almost, but, but also I think what you see is civil society uh, just forming out of, out of, out of ether almost. Um, most of these gentlemen, some of whom are older than us, um, have had military training, have been in the Soviet army, have been in the Ukrainian army, have been in the Donbass. 
So they have some field craft. They do know how to shoot a rifle. A lot of the younger people don't. Um, I'm engaged a lot with people there via email and telephones. Um, you know, a, a, a real army would have, would have taken care of them rather quickly. But the Russian army is not a real army. And so I think what you're seeing now is kind of the equivalent of 1914 all over again, but with drones, missiles, and aircraft. Uh, but otherwise, it's a slugfest. I think this is important from a US perspective and a NATO perspective in that I think some people may look at these victories on the part of the Ukrainians as validating our policies and uh, security assistance, security cooperation programs over the last few years. And, and I'm not so sure I accept that. I think there's been some, I think you see some islands of, of, of expertise. Um, but if you look closely at some of the victories that you've seen, it's territorial defense forces, it's just a bunch of neighborhood guys getting together with AK-47s and RPGs, ro ro rocket patrol, propelled grenades. And as you saw with the Neptune sinking the Moskva, that, that was developed by a private company, not anything associated with the Ministry of Defense and uh, government-owned defense industry. So this is a very, very complex conflict. And, and the lessons learned, we're gonna have to be very suspicious and very careful and follow the data, as, if we can find it. Okay, thank you. C could we uh, follow up a little bit and actually quite take that a job on social scientists because uh, I mean honestly I would agree with that that uh, theoretists theoreticians of Mersheimer's kind of a style of social science tend to take history kind of uh, regardless of the context they just use it as a uh, one of the people who described it as a as a scripture, you know, kind of like picking up verses or uh, as, a, as, as evidence, like. as, mm -hmm. a, as you like, without the historic con context. And that's nice to have people who actually do have the uh, historic context. I was just thinking, Sky, one of your uh, sessions is called Shape of Future War. Like, do you mm. have something to say to the way how the war is done uh, to what Tom said? Well. First, one comment about political scientists. Um, I have four degrees. None of them are in political science. Praise what, one of them is international Praise relations. One of them is international affairs. One of them is in public administration. And, I'm, and, my, and my doctorate was from, was from Oxford. And they don't have political science at Oxford. They have politics. Politics is an art. It's not a science. So um, I always found it curious that I've spent my life in departments of political science, but I am not one. Actually, um, I want to say I agree. I, I, when I was chair of our political science department, we changed it to politics. Right. So, yeah. But to your point specifically about Mearsheimer, I mean, it's part of my pet peeve. I mean, it's the selective picking of, of, of historical incidents to make a general theory that doesn't Trans, it doesn't necessarily transfer, as opposed to what I would call the British tradition of politics and international relations, E.H. Carr, Edley Bowles, uh, and so on, uh, and Michael Howard, who is my supervisor, um, that it is really about history. History is the database, and you have to be grounded in history, not statistics and those kinds of things. But um, you asked about the nature of something about the nature of war. And when one of the books we're reading in, in, um, in one of the classes, uh, the Conflict and Democracy series course on security systems, is Sir Lawrence Friedman's um, wonderfully titled book, um, The Future of War, colon, A History. So how can you have a history? It is how we have always thought about what the next war would be like based on the wars that we have, ha that we have had. And one of the things that I think is particularly interesting about this conflict is A, we didn't anticipate what it was going to be. I mean, this looks a lot more like, as you say, a World War I slugfest or um, Russian tactics in Grozny or what Bashar al-Assad did in, in Aleppo and in other, in other cities in Syria. Um, it is it, 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 is, it is not, and there are, there's high-tech weapons, but there's not high-tech thinking. It's not the kind of razzmatazz war that one would think. And, it, and that the essential ingredients in all of this 
um, our leadership and training, not just mass. And I could go on, but I'll leave it at that for now. Okay. Uh, yeah, I would just, because we already started Mersheimer, so let's actually delve into it, because I, I have it as a next point, kind of interesting debate, because uh, during the debates we had in English language, we did quite a lot about sanctions. Yeah. We did um, uh, quite a lot about the impact on Central Europe, but we didn't really get into t too much about the overall strategic importance of the conflict or strategic role. And there I thought it's quite a good way how to segue it by saying that, okay, we ha can have this Mersheim Mersheimer kind of a, I mean, okay, Mersheimer is easy to understand. He has few, um, ideas behind this theory and for some reason he ends up thinking that actually the war is it's about uh, the West versus Russia so and I know that uh, uh, it's very simplistic and uh, so we could address that I think I'll uh, turn to Jim because you could give us more historically grounded idea of that conflict. I think that's uh, where you come yeah, in. Yeah, I, I mean, I, if The you, mic. Oh, sorry, yes, I told you I'd forget. Um, but I think when you think about why uh, Putin decided to make this decision, there are several things going on. Um, I did see a panel where, on streamed, where Mearsheimer was talking and he did his usual great power argument. Um, and, then there was a response by a woman named Marlene Laruel, who is a very expertise, and she said, a lot of the things you make sense, except for you have, you have to remember that Putin made this choice in the end, that Putin is the one who made the choice. And, um, and he didn't need to make that choice. And in fact, it was not a good choice, as we know now. And so the question is, is why does Putin make this choice? And my sense is it has to do in his vision of history, and this may take a couple minutes, uh, uh, um, his vision of history, and I'll try to be as quickly as possible. I think that Putin's attitudes towards, there are certain things that have been constant in his attitude since he took office in 2000, uh, or 1999 actually as prime minister, where he thinks that Russia needs a great, a strong state, and if it doesn't have a strong state, it will fall into collapse as the, he thought it did in the 90s and other foreign powers would take advantage of it. So he's been trying to do that pretty much since 2000. He has started out, however, he's very keen on thinking about power, which is why he gives birthday cakes to uh, Xi Jinping. Um, and um, so, uh, you know, I think he started by thinking of ways in which he could maintain his power and still work in a little bit. I don't know how sincere that was. I don't know what was going on. Uh, there were several things that I thought that the U.S. throughout could have done better. Uh, I, I was like many people who studied Russia in particular who were kind of skeptical about NATO because we saw how NATO was going to, I mean, Russia was going to respond, although I've since changed my mind on that completely. Um, but I think it could have been handled more. I think the early 2000s were very uh, formative in Putin's ideas uh, with the removal, the U.S. withdrawal from the ABM Treaty, uh, which was uh, the background of the form foundation of U.S.-Soviet strategic dialogue. Um, the fact that the U.S. went into Iraq, which... Uh, made Putin think that this was a revisionist power, which was then further reinforced by the, the action in Libya. And also, um, and then this is where Putin's paranoia, the whole thing about the, the Orange Revolutions, which he clearly ascribed to what the US was doing. And there was a little bit of evidence that the US had helped, assisted some of the organizers, but you couldn't explain the Orange Revolution by the U.S. There was no way to do that, and that was just his vision. And in some ways, he feels he 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 looks at the world in a way like Mearsheimer that says, "Great powers run things. People don't have agency. Small powers don't have agency. So it's not Ukraine did this or Ukrainian people decided this. It was it had to be somewhere behind a great power." And then the big shift comes in 2011, 2012, when there are the mass 
uh, protests in Moscow, and he sees, after the Arab Spring, after the Orange Revolution, he sees the United States coming after him. And at this point, he makes a speech where he changes his vision of the world. The US, the Russia is no longer a part of Europe. It's no longer a part of Europe's civilization. It is a civilization unto itself. We are going to block out. The liberals have no role in Russian thinking anymore. He brings together people like Dugan and people who are real uh, nationalist extremists. This is only reinforced uh, by the 2014-2015, uh, 2013-2014 uh, Maidan. And in this vision, Russia is a civilization, it's a thousand year civilization. And he always made this is a thousand year civilization, which if you go back a thousand years, brings us to Rus, Kievan Rus, where both Ukraine and Russia so and this feeds into his ideas, Russia has to be great again, Russia has to do this. And this is why he can say he believes to some extent that Ukraine is an existential question for him because he does not see it as an independent country which has agency. He sees it as part of the historical Russian empire. And so therefore, he is willing to, and increasingly in COVID, he is increasingly with a very small group of people. We know that. Uh, there are very people like Medinsky, people like uh, Shoigu, people like, and, and they're all very right wing, and they're all promoting this vision of the great power of Russia, which leads him to think that um, as Ukraine seems to be slipping from his grasp, he has to bring it back. And this leads him to what, for him, and for Russia, and more importantly for Russia as a whole, is an extraordinarily horrible decision. In addition to its criminal nature, it's just destroying Russia as well as Ukraine. Yeah. So it, in that way, it's, it's like a Milosevic who tries to create greater Serbia, creates smaller Serbia. So. Right. Thank you. I'll actually ask uh, your thoughts, uh, Tom and Sky. Uh, Tom, you had some ideas that you would add with the, what is the NATO dimension? And is there one? Like, is it, because I, uh, that was like the Russian-Ukrainian relationship. So how does the NATO come into it? Into what, the war? Oh, into the war, yes. A broader Western perspective, uh, you can you could say NATO, um, but I think what you're seeing the response is from I think all Western democracies. You see Australia, South Korea, New Zealand, and Japan um, uh, lining up, providing assistance. Uh, I think, as I mentioned to Katarina, is um, I I honestly think this is from the perspective of of, of Putin and. Maybe even Shugoy, Shugoy and, um, and Gerasimov. I think this is a proxy war. I think Ukraine is, is convenient because it is you, you, a successful Ukraine is an existential threat to a totalitarian Russia. That's clear. Um, and this gets to the whole idea of, of um, Ukrainian nationalism. I, many Americans don't seem to understand. They say, well, you know, so many people in eastern Ukraine, they speak Russian, so they're, they identified with Russia. And it's like mm -hmm. the people fighting the hardest are the Russian-speaking Ukrainians in eastern Ukraine. And what people don't seem to understand is that Ukraine, and I please correct me if I'm wrong, but I think Ukraine is, is distinct in, in central and eastern Europe in that it, Ukrainian nationalism is not defined by language. I mean, if you're Czech, you speak Czech. That makes you Czech, or you, or, or Slovak, or, or Romanian. In in Ukraine, you simply don't have that that feeling. Yes, there is Ukrainian, mainly spoken in the in the West, but it's not the literary great language of Russian. That's definitely for sure. But you know, some of the people who are fighting the hardest are are uh, Russian speakers in the <laughs> East, and and indeed, if you look at Kharkiv, um, I've predicted since I, I left Ukraine working there in, in 2016, that if the Russians ever moved into that, that region, 
Um, the hardest fighting they would get would be in Kharkiv, and indeed the Russians have yet to take Kharkiv. Um, I'm not so sure they can, and you may not know why, but I can tell you Kharkiv has a very large Jewish population. And they're, they're not interested in, 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 in the czar and the pogroms and everything that comes with it. So Ukrainian nationalism, you have to, have, you have to understand that to understand why it is, it's doing what it's doing. Now, the whole issue with, with being a successful democracy, and that is one thing you can say about Ukraine, it's a young democracy, it's imperfect, but they do change power, the parties do change. Um, and I, I think this, this reinforces you know, Putin's efforts to try to divide the West. It's, it's clear he interferes in Western elections. Um, I mean, it's clear there was Russian money in support of Brexit. You know, any fissures that, that, that he can throw in to divide the West is, is he defines as being in, his be in, in Russia's best interest. And of course, you know, the irony in all of this is all, he's, all of his actions have done is to solidify the West across the globe. Um, okay, he's had some success with, with Orban, but every, you would expect that. Everybody knows that and it was predicted. Um, but so far he hasn't. And you know, would, we, would we have thought 12 months ago that you know, Sweden and, and Finland would be actually debating in their respective parliaments uh, the idea of joining NATO you know, before the fall, if not even sooner. So I think from the NATO perspective, um, I think we're in a very delicate position. Um, I don't think anybody wants to escalate this. It's escalated as far as I think from the Western perspective, it's, it's been escalated too far. And we have to try to find some ways to uh, deter Russia as much as we can uh, with their provocative actions against the West, flying into you know, uh, NATO sovereign uh, nations um, airspace on a regular basis. Um, and um, tr try to, you know, is it in our best interest, as we say in English, to try to help Putin find an off-ramp, some course of action where he can step down, but I don't see him stepping down without losing face. Mm -hmm. And in Russian culture, when you lose face, it means you're a loser. And, and the, uh, the wolves will be out. So I think from NATO, Western perspective, I, 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 I give great credit to the Biden administration so far. I wish they'd talk less. But in comparison to what we would have had, personal opinion, I mean, if this had happened two years ago, I mean, I, I shudder to think what, what, what the previous president would have done. It just, it, it, it frightens me to my socks. Okay, thank you. Sky, could you also add, um, yeah, the nature of the conflict, origins of the conflict, we have the more like broader historic uh, cultural perspective and the kind of NATO role in that. So do, do you think it's either or or both? Either or both what? In, in, the, in, in the sense of like actually what helps us explain the situation better like proxy war with um, um, NATO or kind of it, role of Ukraine and the narrative? It, it may be a proxy war in Putin's mind. Yeah. I, I don't think this is a proxy war in NATO's mind at all. And there are some in, some in the West who are saying, well, this is really, we don't really care about Ukraine. This is a proxy war. This is an opportunity to fight Russia. I think that's baloney. Um, but it is a proxy war, I think, for all the reasons that have been said here about in, in Putin's mind. And I think the other thing that has been implied here, but I think just needs to be said out loud, is that you know, we think about, well, what is rational? Well, Putin was irrational. He was living in a bubble that was feeding his own vision, his distorted vision of the world, and a distorted vision about what the Russian military could do and a distorted vision of, of, of the weakness of Ukraine and Ukrainian civilization, and he acted upon that. He was, very he was relatively restrained in 2014. So I don't think his vision changed since 2014, but I think he concluded that he could do something different now than he could have done in 2014. Um, perhaps because he thought the West, the United States was distracted because of Afghanistan and NATO was falling apart and the West is so divided and is corrupt and contaminated and all of that. And he's taken that to believe that he was invincible. 
And we all know what happens when leaders who have too much power and the belief, the false belief that they're invincible, they just do stupid things. And in this case, this was, this was, a, this was a very stupid calculus on, on his part, um, which is why I don't know of anyone who predicted this because no one would else would have come up with the rational, using any rational calculus, would have weighed the cost benefits, uh, the costs and benefits of this any, 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 any different. Now it puts NATO at a very difficult position because, because he is not of, I'll just say, I'm not saying Putin, Putin is rational within his frame, but his frame is distorted. Within that frame, we have to be very careful not to give him excuses to do something else. Because we could say, we can sit here and say it would be irrational for Putin to use a tactical nuclear, a, a tactical nuclear, nuclear weapons are never tactical, a battlefield nuclear weapon because he wants to make a point. And we could sit here and say, that would be irrational for him to do that. But I'm perfectly, uh, but I'm perfectly capable of thinking that he would do that within his own frame of rationality. And that, I think, is the biggest thing that NATO, all of NATO, all of Europe, has to be careful about. Um, there is, in the, in the United States, this debate about whether, I mean, actually, we have bar bipartisan support about America's role in this war in, in a way that we have, like, no bipartisan support of anything else. Um, and if anything, the Republicans are discontented with Mr. Biden because he's not doing enough. But those who say we ought to do more, and there was a poll just released the other day, if you said, would you do more if it meant risky nuclear war? Well, well then that comes back out. So this is the delicate balancing act we have to play. This could well end up being a very long conflict. And how much are we going to push? How much are we going to push to a man who will make all the decisions, who I think might have had an off-ramp in mind at one point, but if he really wanted that, he could have negotiated that without the war. But the longer this war goes on, the more the destruction, the less likely Putin is going to compromise on anything, and frankly, the less likely Mr. Zelensky and the Ukrainians are going to be able to compromise about anything. So I think we're in for a long, very delicate balance here. Okay. Um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I wanted to say I agree completely. Um, I would say that if you've been reading what Putin's so my take beforehand was he could do this, but it would be incredibly stupid. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, and, and the same goes for tactical nuclear weapons. My, I guess I have heard from people who, um, when they first announced this escalate to de-escalate thing, oh people from NATO went there and said, by the way, that doctrine doesn't work with us. No, 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 escalate no, to de-escalate, no. escalate leads to escalation, and yeah. there's no other way around it. You do a new tactical nuclear, as you say, I totally agree. It's like northern Alabama, as somebody said. Um, you know, the tactical nuclear weapon will reply with the tactical nuclear weapon. You go further, we'll go further, and there's just, there's just no way around that. So I'm very right. pleased to have heard that. Um, and also, I want to say something about Ukrainian identity. There's actually been some very great studies by political scientists in Ukraine uh, Volodymyr Kulik and Olga Onuf and people like that who have shown that since uh, the Maidan, in fact, you have had a significant move to what you call the civic identity. That indeed, um, Russian language and Russian even ethnicity, you know, if your parents were Russian and you're, you know, that doesn't matter as much to Ukrainians. They identify, if you ask who they identify, we identi identify as Ukraine as our homeland regardless of our background, regardless of our language. We're not Kazakhs. Oh, what? We, we are not Russians. No. Even though you speak Russian. We are not Russians. Right, right. Oh, and right, yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah, we are not Russians, and we wouldn't want to be governed by, by one. Russia. Right, right, yes, exactly. Right. Yeah, because yeah. that's what I've uh, kind of noticed, that uh, why these uh, Eastern uh, um, Ukrainian fight the hardest, well, they will because say their, their they see... Is, they yeah. see what happened in Do Donetsk and Lugansk. They see how it's governed, uh, how the quality of life and everything went down. And What's interesting is these th polls say, they still say they're ethnically Russian, mm -hmm. but they say that's not what's important. 
they say the important thing is we are home, Ukraine is our homeland. Right? Yeah, go ahead. Just very quickly on nukes, um, nuclear weapons. What Sky said is 100% correct. It's a slight nuance. In the West, we, we, we have a very binary view of what nuclear weapons. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and, and for all the right reasons. One of the things that always concerns me about Russians with nukes is two things. One, unfortunately, the Russian army traditionally has been dominated by artillerists. And as such, um, much of the early thinking, and I think it's still there, of Russian thinking about nukes is by n artillerists. So for their perspective, it's just big artillery, a and it's not. And then the second point, I had a, speaking of history, I had an interesting discussion fall 1990. I was in the Amt, the foreign office in Bonn, and uh, having discussions about intermediate range nuclear forces our modernization or, uh, of, these, of these, these weapons. And um, I asked one of the diplomats, one of the guys I dealt with regularly, how the two plus four negotiations were going. This was the agreement amongst France, Britain, Germany, and the United States with then the Soviet Union because East Germany basically disintegrated. So it was four plus one in effect. How are the negotiations going? They said, well, we think it's going all right. And you know, we're, we're getting there. We'll have an agreement. And, I said, how about the nukes? And he said, well, you know, interesting, Foreign Minister Genscher, you know, discussed this just two weeks ago with their counterparts. And at, on a side meeting, you know, one of us went to one of the German, uh, one of the Russian generals, because it was a Russian general's staff doing the negotiations without lawyers, let that sink in, which is why the two plus four treaty is so favorable to the West. Um, asked in a sidebar with one of the Russian generals, um, by the way, Everything's going okay with uh, Escape Guta, you know, finding you know, all these nuclear weapons and repatriating them back to Russia. And the Russian general, an artillerist, responded, yeah, we think so. <laughs> now, from the perspective of, of somebody in the West who's dealt at the policy level with nukes and Sky who's dealt with it much more than me, the idea that you think you've controlled all of your nuclear weapons is really something quite disconcerting. So yeah. I, what I'm suggesting is that escalate to de-escalate is insanity, yeah. I agree, but don't think the Russians think about nukes the way we do. Yeah. I think they think about them much more promiscuously as, as a tactical effect than we do. You're right, if it's a 155 artillery piece shooting a nuclear tip, you know, artillery shell, that's strategic. It, it's, 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 it's from one artillery tube, but the effect is strategic. Right. And I just want to point out that the notion, I mean, there are some in the U.S. who think the escalate to de-escalate is a reasonable strategy for the West, which I absolutely disagree with. But I think it is a fair point to say that the Russians have played with that notion. And we may think it's irrational, but then... You know, the invasion of Ukraine, everyone thought was irrational. And right? that's what you have. And, and, right. and, and so we need to be careful about uh, assuming what Putin may or may not do, which is part of his game. And which is the kind of greatest analytical conundrum, like yeah. actually get it to right, because as you said, no one predicted it. And if someone did, like, well, let's say two years ago, I don't think he's actually telling the truth. And if we would go through the Twitter feeds, a lot of people would say that's a nonsense. When they first came with the assessments that they will invade, the actually a lot of people kind of now are kind of um, backtracking because they actually miscalculated that, so. Just one step, a lot of Ukrainians thought this was gonna happen. Yeah. Or they didn't. I actually had also quite a lot of people heard that said, no, he won't do that. It's just like, so, uh, yeah. There's an American expression about, you know, when the dog chases the car, after he catches up with the car, what does he do with it? <laughs> and, and I think, and I, I, th I think that's just an apt illustration. I mean, it, it was often said after 20, when people were in 2014 were saying, no, Putin wants to take all of Ukraine. And 
and, and A, he, even if he could, he wouldn't know what to do with it. He couldn't politically occupy it. And I think he was logical and restrained in 2014. He was, okay, we're going to have some frozen conflicts like we have in South Lucetia and Abkhazia and other places, um, and that will work for me. I can say to my friends at home, I'm protecting my Russian brethren, and I can reap havoc upon the West, and I'm getting all the benefits with few risks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that, I mean, the Gerasimov, doc Gerasimov doctrine was about hybrid warfare is all about getting the political objectives at minimum risk. And that seems to be turned on its head now. Yeah. Pretty, pretty fanatic. <laughs> yeah, and it's a big hammer and relatively political or nuanced gain because uh, I would, yeah, anyway. Uh, let's move to the modus vivendi, like the conflicts here. So we have some notions about, well, what, who is the enemy, although we can't really predict him very well, so that's the part of the way how to live with it. So where are we headed? Because I know we don't have a crystal ball. That, that's what we tell the students all the time, especially in the methodology courses, that we can't really predict the future, and especially war is such a interactive um, business so that, but um, where do you see, uh, and uh, I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but one of you mentioned some possible settlements. Um, was it you, Sky, uh, mentioned the possible? Uh, I think a couple of us did, but yeah. um, but I'm, I'm, I'm happy to start on that. I mean, it, mm. I mean, the elements of a potential settlement have always been there, and they've always been pretty obvious. Zelensky himself has said, I mean, on the one hand, Putin says, this is all about, we got to keep Ukraine out of NATO. And Zelensky says, I'm ready to put neutrality on the table, but the real question is, what kind of neutrality, right? I mean, we do have a Budapest memorandum from 1994 that took all, was easy to write because it took existing language from the UN Charter, the Charter of Paris, OSCE documents, and other things, and just packaged it all together. So nobody was making a new commitment, and for Zelensky, it's pretty clear that's not going to be good enough. NATO, actually, there are, Evo Dalder, who former U.S. ambassador to NATO, wrote a couple of weeks ago, and I had uttered this about a month ago, but I wasn't former ambassador to NATO, so nobody cared. But... It's, a, it's an interesting what if, that if Ukraine had been in NATO, would Putin have done this? Because he hasn't done anything in the Baltics. Evil Dalder has suggested that maybe we ought to be reconsidering whether, whether that would be. And I don't think that's going to be in the cards unless Zelensky gets a full-on victory and the Russians just turn tail and leave, and that's not going to happen. You've got a lot of issues here that Zelensky can put on the table in return for some benefits. He can recognize Crimea. He can, I don't think he politically can give up Don, uh, 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 Donetsk and, and uh, uh, Luhansk, but I think he can make some and could have done this, they could have, the Ukrainian government could have done this before. Uh, make some concessions about relative autonomy. At one point, Putin was talking about some federal formula. Um, there are things that both sides can put on the table, and, 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 and certainly that Zelensky can give to Russia in return for Russia getting out. Hard, you know, one of the harder questions is going to be things like reparations. Who's going to rebuild this country? Um, I think I think Ukraine will probably end up in the EU at some point. And the irony, and I think I don't know which one of you made a mention about Milosevic and Greater Serbia, or less and ending up with Lesser Serbia. But I think if Putin has anything left and from this, it's going to be so much less of what he had before. And if he has anything, and and if he takes just part of Ukraine, that almost guarantees that the rest of Ukraine is going, to be, uh, is going to be more closely associated with the West, certainly in the EU, if not also in NATO, or with some 
NATO light guarantee uh, that somebody creative will, 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 st will still come up with. Uh, but at the end of the day, Putin comes up with much less than what he had. Yeah, uh, Jim, I think, how do you reconcile it with the his kind of the historical, because I think if, if it was just security wise, there would be a lot of things to, to offer and the compromise that um, President Zelensky actually offered, like it kind of, it seemed like a concession, like, okay, then we won't end up in NATO and let's uh, negotiate that. It's not about the, no the security just yet, is it? Or the kind of the hard notion of security. I mean, I, I think what um, Sky said about that Putin has placed himself in a box, and he would be have a hard time sort of, for a, for a while, he won't be able to give anything up until it really looks like there's no success. I think it's clear that, you know, he's already failed in some respects if he doesn't use a tactical nuclear weapon. Um, but battlefield nuclear battlefield. Sorry, yes, sorry. Um, years and years of lo lo um, the, the language. Yes. So, um, so I don't see that he's in a position to do that right mm -hmm. now, yeah. um, and so I think it will be a long slog. Uh, I think that, f and I agree with what Sky said about what the law possible likelihood is. I think as far as the autonomy, the, the decentralization, I think that the Ukrainians would balk at that. They've already decentralized in the last five years. And so um, and, and so this would be seen as Russia telling them what to do, and they don't want to do that in their domestic politics. Um, it is interesting. I mean, as a Ukrainian scholar said, Putin is done for building a coherent more, done more for building a coherent Ukrainian nation than anybody else in the history. Um, by removing Crimea and Donetsk and Luhansk, he's removed about 12 to 15 percent of reliable pro-Russian voters. Um, and so, you know, they don't have a chance of, and always the elections were very close. Now they wouldn't be. So, um, so the future, I, I, I mean, I don't see an, a, a close, a, a, an easy out at the moment. Which is not very, um, it doesn't encourage us too much, but Tom, you had follow up. Yeah, I have three quick points. Um, this whole issue of Ukraine in NATO, I mean, this idea that, you know, Putin said, I have to keep, you know, I have to invade to keep Ukraine from joining NATO. There is no way prior to February this year that Ukraine had any pathway into NATO. It just, I mean, it's, it's, it's preposterous. As a causus belli, this is just a non-starter. France and Germany, particularly Germany, would have, you know, vetoed, and they've made it very clear since 2008 that, you know, this is not on the agenda. So this whole idea of you know, keeping them out of NATO is, is stupid. Now maybe, and uh, this, this is something that we need to think harder about in the West, you know, Collective defense is like pregnancy. It's one of the few things in the world which is truly binary. You know, you're pregnant or you're not. You know, we're all in NATO, so we're all pregnant with our own collective defense. What I have seen NATO do, because we, we, we want to help, we want to, we want to stay true to our values. You know, we're like, look, Ukraine, Georgia, you're not gonna get into NATO but we can have all these special programs and, and, and arrangements and discussions and we change the names but nothing really changes in terms of substance, in terms of, you know, we continue to talk but you're not gonna get the security guarantees, you're not gonna get the collective defense agreement. I wonder, however, if the signaling, we should have been better at that to Russia if for no other reason just to dominate the narrative that they're not getting in but we're friendly to everybody. And if you're very friendly to us, like Ukraine has, we're gonna be even more friendly, and that's it. So th th this is maybe some self-criticism. Um, uh, Evo's argument that you know, we wouldn't be here if Ukraine was already in NATO, I think he's probably right. The problem is, when would they have come into NATO? <laughs> that's kind of an important question to ask because that, is, you know, con that contextualizes everything. Because quite frankly, if, if, an extend, if we had extended an invitation to Ukraine, 
uh, for uh, membership. I mean, that in itself could have been a casus belli on the part of the Russians. So it's, it's an interesting uh, intellectual argument, but I'm not necessarily sure that I buy it. The second point, Zelensky's gonna have to be very careful what he negotiates. Um, you know, I've heard many Ukrainian people, friends, colleagues, acquaintances say, you know, we've had a couple Maidans and, you know, and they came damn close with Poroshenko. You know, we'll have another one. You know, if anybody sells us out, you know, we're going back to the Maidan and we're gonna overthrow the government again. And so when Zelensky says, in the end, it's just land, we have to be more concerned about human beings, he'd better be very careful because if you're talking about Luhansk, Donetsk, and now what's left of Mariupol, um, Hershon and the rest, he's got to be very careful because there's a lot of people there that aren't going to necessarily say, well, you know, I'm willing to give up, you know, my oblast as a sacrifice. Um, and equally, I wish the Ukrainian nationals, who I love them dearly, you know, you can almost always find a grain of truth to the Russian narrative of the suppression of Russians and Russian, the language, because inevitably, as we saw in 14 with the Maidan, you know, you always get these proposals for language law where U Ukrainian is going to have to, is going to be mandatory. And that is a red button for, for, for Russia and for many Russians. Like, why should I learn another language? Because Ukrainian is this hilly billy language they speak, you know, in, in, in Western Ukraine. Well, Parliament actually passed that in 2014. You know, it's like, why do you do this? this you're not helping yourself. So, Ukrainians need to figure that out on them, themselves because what Ukrainians will tell you is that, yeah, we go to school, we go to the government office, we speak Ukrainian, but we can't wait to go outside where we can speak Russian again. <laughs> and then the last point, the end game. If anybody has a prediction on that, don't believe them. <laughs> but but my, my, my fear is uh, we will have a much larger dangerous frozen conflict and, and that only benefits Russia because it enables Russia to make mischief um, whenever it wants. And uh, having spent a lot of time in Moldova, you know, the, 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 the perniciousness of, of Russian policy vis-a-vis -vis, um, frozen conflicts, it knows no end. And if this, if this comes down to basically uh, an armistice along the lines of uh, uh, Russian forces, you know, occupying certain elements of eastern Ukraine, God help us, let's hope not the southern, southern part of Ukraine. Um, this is just, it's, it, this, this war will continue at a very low insurgency uh, bleeding. It will just bleed both countries until at some point all wars must end, as friend e. Clay, Freddie Clay wrote, mm -hmm. yeah. at, at which point, I don't know. But mm -hmm. we'll have to have a political settlement at some point. And yeah. I can't tell you when. And we can't tell when. So this is a good place where to stop the, our discussion and open it to the public. So actually you've heard um, ranges of ideas so you can, you know, it's up to you what you want to discuss further. So are there questions? Yes, there's, okay, so for, okay, so go ahead. Okay. Okay, I'm going to repeat that question for the recording. Um, so the, your question is uh, that uh, where are uh, Ukrainians standing on the Donetsk and Lugansk um, question at the moment? Would they be willing to give it up? Or uh, is that a zero sum game for them at the moment? I can very quickly answer. It depends who you ask in the parliament, in the, in, in the Rada and in the, in, the, in the Oblast. I think you have a range of, of views, but I, th I think if there, if, if, the, if there are territories on the negotiating table that, that will be surrendered to Russia, there's gonna be opposition for sure in, in Ukraine. If I can predict one thing, it would be that. I, I'm just going to say I absolutely agree, and I think Zelensky at one point said not an, not a not a single Ukrainian or an inch of Ukrainian soil. 
So it might end up in a frozen, it might be like the Baltic states for 60 years. You know, we're, we're not recognizing it. Um, it, may, it may be something like that, and then it'll be a slow conflict after that. But I don't think he's going to give it up. And I agree. Hanzo? Okay, so I'll repeat the question. So we are commenting that things changed a lot or everything changed. And so, so the question is, what actually might be the constraints on uh, Vladimir Putin's behavior? Um, that's a good question. Of course, we know nothing about what's going on. We get hints and rumors, some of which turn out to be true, some of which turn out to be false. Um, it's clear that the decision was made in a way that many people who were, you know, not in the upper, upper, upper range were kind of surprised. I get from people like, you know, people in the foreign policy establishment, they mostly expressed surprise. There was an interesting um, interview with Dmitry Trenin, who is the, one of the foreign policy specialists at the Carnegie Center, but he's actually very much in, in the know with people. And he, when I heard an interview with him the day after Putin made his speech, and it was clear that he was flabbergasted by the speech. He just had no idea that this was coming. And he had no idea how to respond to it. Since then, he's towed the line. So, um, but at that time, he was just confused. Um, so this was a decision that was made. I. We don't know uh, how constrained he is. Um, I think that globally, or in terms of, I mean, obviously the Russian government is going to be constrained in terms of how they get money and things like that, um, which may push them more to China as the only option. Um, and But it would be as the younger brother, as it were, to China, which I don't think he'd like, and I think a lot of other people would dislike that too. Um, and uh, so I wish I knew, I wish anybody knew. I don't know if anybody knows. I think that there clearly are a lot of people uh, who are close to the higher ranks of power who are frustrated. Um, but uh, they probably aren't in the very highest, and there's no way to know what's going on there. Okay, I have two reactions again. So, yeah, Sky and then Tom. Just very quickly, I think the longer this goes on, the constraints get bigger for him. Um, I, I don't see a, I don't see a trajectory that works in his advantage. Whether he recognizes that within his bubble, I don't know. But with respect to China. You were originally talking about China being, you know, not taking sides, but this is, he just signed a 5,000 plus word document of friendship on all matters with Xi Jinping. No limits. No limits to this friendship. And yet, Xi Jinping is trying to figure out how to back himself out of this thing. He'll take the commercial advantages, of course, because he needs, he needs to buy, th buy energy from Russia. But there's a limit to what China's going to put up with. And it may be a thing, maybe maybe one of these things over time. Uh, and then there's the whole question of the internal. I mean, I'm not a Russian historian, but I, you know, governments fall in Russia not from the outside but from the inside. And do I see anything happening now? No. But when things start to unravel, and they begin to look like they're going to unravel out of control, that again will will Putin see that? But that'll be that that'll be the big question. Um, the, the, there's one kind of quick parallel. Um, 19, in 1999, NATO's bombing of Kosovo. Frankly, we were not winning that war. We were not winning that war. But we can be thankful that Mr. Chernomirdin showed up in Belgrade to tell Mr. Milosevic, we've got bigger fish to fry. 
So you better get out. You better stop this. We're not going to support you anymore. That ended the war in Kosovo in 1999, not NATO bombing. And um, so some internal and external stimulus to Mr. Putin that says to him, I'm either going to get thrown out in a very violent way or I'm going to be isolated and I'm going to be in, 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 in unrecoverable, or I'm going to have to find an off-ramp and then look like I can declare victory somehow. But that's not going to happen anytime soon. So not the May 9th? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so. Um, that's an excellent question, and I think we should think much harder about that, because that's, that's going to help us, I think, inform policy better, and I wish we thought more about these things. I have t two specific points. One, I think a, a huge constraint is his constituency. His constituency are not the Russian people, they are the oligarchs. The oligarchs in favor. There are some oligarchs in favor, there are some who are not in favor. Uh, the oligarchs are not in business to lose money. They're not in business to lose access to enjoying their money in the West. You know, nobody in their right mind in Russia has money in a Russian bank. Okay, it's, it's, it's in London, it's in Cyprus, it's in Dubai, it's somewhere else. And uh, frozen. And fr right. and that, well, not all not of it, all, all. But, 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 well. but, you know, it's, it's, it's getting tighter and tighter. And so I think, you know, a constraint on him is as the, you know, Western sanctions take hold and if we get more and more serious about it and really uh, you know, maybe the decision yesterday, the announcement yesterday that the, uh, the British government is now going to freeze services um, to Russia. Let's see if they can actually follow through with that because if, <laughs> I mean, this, the, the city of London, I don't know how much, you know, Russian oligarch money cascades through there, but what percentage, but it's not a small amount. No. I think the, you know, the British economy and the British, you know, banking sector and accounting sector and the consultants and the lawyers I don't think they're going to be very happy about this, but I mean, if we're serious, this is what we're going to have to do. And, and that can start putting constraints on Putin. And I think Putin realizes that, you know, if he makes, you know, he's got to be careful because these guys will kill him. I mean, let's, let's be clear. And so I think that in itself is a huge constraint on him and it's only going to get worse. I agree with Sky. The second point is um, PRC, the P People's Republic of China. There's actually, it's very limited capacity for Putin to, to shift particularly natural gas from, you know, Russia to, to China. I think there's only one pipeline. And pipelines take a while to build. You know, ask our friends with Nord Stream 2. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I, for Putin to say, well, we'll ship our, 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 pet, our, our petroleum and our gas, you know, westward, uh, eastward, um, as he found out when he tried that after uh, seizing um, uh, Crimea in 2014, you know, the Chinese are, are not stupid businessmen, and they, they really got the price down quite low. And, it, and Russian, you know, Russian hydrocarbon industry lost a hell of a lot of money on that. So I don't think the PRC is going to, is going to bail him out or help him. And I think the third constraint, so I, I lied, I had three points. I can't, I'm an economist, so I can't count by definition. You're all <laughs> right, so everything's in threes. Correct. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> my students will say it's threes. Um, Defense industry. Putin has killed Russian defense industry. I think when we look back at this, um, it was already in very bad shape. You're not going to get the components what they need to be able to build the missiles that they, they've been building. Um, you know, the uh, Iskander and the rest of these things, um, it's done. And, you know, the, the underinvestment in defense industry is, is quite striking when you look at something. You know, you still have this vibrant, you know, system of bureaus, design bureau in, in Russia that designed these, you know, very fast jets that are kind of meaningless. But, you know, the, I think it's a Sukhoi 34. I think they're building four or six a year. Okay, a very small plant in South Carolina, Greenville, South Carolina, that's building F-16s. We're doing four and we hope to be up to six per month. So... You know, Russian defense industry was already strapped, and I don't see how he's going to re-equip the force. I just don't, particularly with the precision-guided weaponry. That's going to diminish over time, very quickly, I think. One, by the way, one source, 
a friend of mine who was actually captured by the Russians, who was a defense journalist in Kiev, uh, told me that his sources tell him that they started the war with about 220 Iskanders, and they're down to about 40 now. Mm -hmm. So they, they shot off a lot in Syria and Libya, and they haven't really had the capacity to build more. So if they're down to 40, and that was two, three weeks ago, what are they down to now? Yeah. They still have the alt uh, artillery. Yeah, but that's only good for about 30, 40 clicks. Yeah. They're, not gonna, they're not gonna be able to reach, you know, you know uh, Lviv for much longer. No. Okay, can I, can uh, yeah, say? go ahead. I mean, about the oligarchs, I mean, I, I agree, but it should be remembered that in after 2015, Putin sort of did some remaneuvering among the oligarchs and who's in power and shifted people who were less dependent on him out. Um, and so, like, the head of the National Guard there is now his former bodyguard. Mm -hmm. So they're less likely to, and, and many of the ones that were sort of pre-Putin have been sort of out of the policy making for some way. So they could still gather together, but if anything, they're trying to gather together to overthrow him or anything, and he finds out through one of his leaks, they're all going to go. So it's, it's, it, they would have to be very courageous to do that and to do that. I mean, it could be possible if they see that everything's going to be lost. That would be the only, and that could be very likely very soon. So I think it's going to be constrained, but a, a coup is very difficult there. Okay. Uh, that's quite, uh, yep. There's another, someone else? Uh, uh, not, uh, okay. Okay, so the question is that if um, there is a, some option of actually Vladimir Putin dying or getting get them getting rid of Vladimir Putin, and then would it be followed by a cascade of like dissolution of the Federation, also by violent means? Uh, yeah, it's impossible to. S I mean, I, I can't say. Um, clearly, unlike Stalin, uh, there was a party and there was a Politburo, and so when Stalin died, they could get together and they could decide they want to preserve the party. Under Putin, there isn't really no party, there's only Putin. And so there is less basis for an institutional stability, a change. And so um, I, uh, the, there certainly would be a struggle for power. I mean, that's why Putin stays in power is because he, and why he has to be a strong man is because all of these different forces, they recognize, A, that he's powerful, and if there's a split between them, he can decide among them without having the whole system collapse. So if Putin dies, the struggle between the different oligarchs or the different clans or whatever you call them um, is likely to get sharper, whether it goes into violence or not, I have no idea. Um, and whether it would be largely. And it also depends upon what the response is, somebody said, from the, the vast majority of the people are. But the idea that Russia without Putin for the, at least the first few years would be any better, it's not necessarily true. I don't know. Some thoughts on that? I, I, you know, I, I, I agree. Uh, it's what happens when you have no institutional institution for political succession. Um, and I think your, your point's exactly right. I mean, when Khrushchev was told that he was done, um, I mean, he just said, okay. Uh, it was, I can either say okay or I can die. Um, but in this case, I mean, Putin has ensured that there is no succession. He doesn't, he, he, that's the irony of all of this, is that his power is actually so insecure that he cannot tolerate any kind of institution around him that would provide for succession. Um, so I think we would be in for a period of chaos. And back to a point that was made, I think, you know, at the beginning, I, I, um, this is about Putin. This isn't about Russians or Russia as a culture or as a country. Um, I'm a great believer in, that's why I'm not a political scientist, because I don't believe in structural determination. Um, leaders matter, right? Would 
what would have happened if there hadn't been a Gorbachev? What would have happened with the end of the Cold War? We might still be in one. Um, what would happen if Slobodan Milosevic were South African and Nelson Mandela were a Serb? <laughs> I mean, it would have made a huge difference. And so I don't, but I don't know who the, who the good guys are, um, but they're probably in jail right now. Maybe Kodorovsky or something, or Armenia. Not yet. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that's probably where I would be the social scientist. There actually, I do believe that actually that where you grow up and how you are shaped actually influences you how work. You know that it's not, uh, but so that would be different debate about agents and structures. There was another question. Okay, so I'll try to summarize the question, which is kind of a question about the rest of the world. And I can see that there are some ideas about that. So one point is that the democracies in Latin America or, or other parts of the world um, are not reacting strongly or they're hesitant to outright condemn Russian actions. Um, and kind of, so, so it seems like the West is almost, the West, whatever that means, is alone in that. Um, and the question also is about India and its security because they have strong relationship with Russia and the defense industry. Actually, if Russians say we can't produce it, what will India do? So it's, do I get it? Yeah, okay, that's it. So I, I can, whoever wants to take it first and then. I'll jump on that. Um, good points, all. Um, like you, I am quite disappointed with many democracies in the world not seeing this for what it is. Uh, COVID, economic uncertainty. I think many countries, they, we say in English, they don't have a dog in the fight. They don't have a strong relationship with Russia. They don't have a strong relationship with Ukraine. You know, uh, Is it because possibly of, of, of superb Russian diplomacy? Doubtful, doubtful. So I, I think it's just indifference. Um, maybe when the forensics comes out of how many people have been, let's just say it for what it is, murdered, um, uh, maybe, but criminally murdered. They haven't died, they've been criminally murdered. Uh, let's make that very clear. That's what the, what the evidence suggests um, by Russian forces. You know, maybe people will, will begin to realize the pernicious and, and evil nature of this regime, and that it is antithetical to, to our concept of democracy. The more intriguing thought that you raise is if you're, if you're China or India, and you look around at all of this Russian kit that you, you bought from Russia or you've built under license, and with it comes the operational concept to use it, and to logistically support it. None of those can be disassociated. You buy the MiG-29, you buy the Sukhoi 35, you have to use it the way the Russians designed it. 
you have to, in terms of the con op, the concept of operation, and in terms of its logistics, which means in the end, most of the maintenance has to go back to somewhere in Moscow or Russia for, for depot level. You know, uh, my, f my, my, my fervent hope is that the Chinese do not figure out they've bought garbage. That if, if, they, if they even, th okay, you might have some really cool long distance missiles, but so what? Everything else you have, radars, are garbage. You know, your platforms, they're targets. You know, I hope they continue to buy this garbage, to be frank. And I would think, the, you know, India, the world's largest democracy, you know, just when we think we have them on side to act rationally with all due respect, then they do something silly like this. You know, they've been very constructive, you know, with, with the Quad, you know, in the Indian Ocean with the Chinese, sorry, with the, sorry, vis-a-vis -vis the Chinese with the, with the Australians and the Japanese. Okay, that's great. They've been doing, their behavior has been great. But then they do something. I don't see what Modi sees in, in this. I don't see what he's going to get out of this. And then the last question is the issue of nukes that you raise. You know, what, what is the continuity of control of Russian, that, that Russian military authorities and political authorities have over those nuclear weapons? You know, I think we had a pretty good idea, I think, back in the Cold War. Do mm -hmm. we have a it good a idea? Role. But yeah, but I'm, well, I'm, I'm worried about those little ones yeah. that, that yeah. you know, the, the big ones, I, okay, but, but it's, they've got some pretty goofy, you know, passive action links that I don't want to go into now, but they've, they've got some pretty goofy things that I, you know, for nukes, I probably would do more than just something simplistic like they've done with a lot of their ta tactical battlefield nuclear weapons. And under investment in defense, in some, in some areas, I mean, have they let that atrophy like we did? in the U.S. Air Force for many years. No, but I mean, we lost a secretary of uh, Air Force and a chief of staff of the Air Force because the Air Force, you know, took their eye off the ball. They didn't see it as a priority. And there were some mistakes made. Whoops. You know, are we, do, how comfortable do we feel that that command and control is still there? At the strategic level, one hopes. At the tactical level, mm, operational level, mm, I'll defer to Sky because he's looked at this much deeper than me. Yeah, with your question about the rest of the world, and, and that's what I began with, one of my pet peeves, is that, uh, and um, I don't have any insight to what they think in Brussels and Washington, et cetera, but I hope they are looking at that and taking it very seriously. Um, I think that, you know, this is an unfortunate distraction in some ways from much, just as the Middle East, but from much more important issues. I mean, if I look at the young people in this audience, what's going to affect them? Pro the threat of nuclear weapons, clearly, if that happens, which could, as we've all talked about. Um, the problem of continued pandemics, also, we've had experience with, and is it going to get, we're we going to have another one? Is it going to be worse? We have to have institutions in place to do that. And climate change, which we know is happening, and you're all going to have to live with it. Um, and this is not helping at all. And so, uh, so therefore, um, and India is going to be a huge player in all of those. I mean, especially climate change because they're growing fast and they're going to have the most people in the world and they rely heavily on coal. So um, the United States and everybody has to take those countries more seriously because these are problems that cannot be, these are problems that will affect the lives and the lifestyles of everybody and they don't depend on military. And in fact, you know, it doesn't even matter because the military is not the driver in those things. It's coal, it's, it's cars, it's uh, power plants, it's, you know, and it's viruses and markets and chickens and stuff like that. So, uh, bats. So, you know, so that is stuff that we have to really pay attention to. And, and, and so we have to have a different conception which would require, you know, to deal with these issues. And, and the U.S. is, it's slightly, it's better now than it was four years ago or three years ago when it was horrible. But um, yes. it's all those really important. Those are the things that are going to affect your life regardless of whatever happens. Just one quick point. I'm not so pessimistic about the, the fact that most countries in the world are 
are, are sitting on the fence. Um, for all the reasons that have been mentioned here, um, their agendas are much bigger than this. This is not, you know, they don't have a dog in this fight. Uh, it's, it's, uh, and in a multi, in a, in, a, in, a, in an increasingly multipolar world in which the issues are economics and public health and climate and development and all the energy and all those kinds of things, um, a country like India is not in the business of trying to uh, burning any bridges with anybody, right? Now, when you look at who's f supporting Mr. Putin in the UN, I can do this with, you know, on two hands with fingers left over, right? Uh, Nicaragua, Venezuela, Central uh, African Republic, Syria, and Belarus, and I probably left out one. Eritrea. Oh, Eritrea, yeah, that's right. I mean. This is a great bunch of characters. Um, <laughs> but everybody else is going to be on the fence. But what I think is interesting, and, and more and more in time, it, as I mentioned before, it gets more difficult for China to say, I'm a great civilization. I'm a great power. You all should understand that I need to be at the table as a great power. And what is the one thing China has beat the table about ever since it was beating a table? Well, it, it, sovereignty and non-interference in the internal affairs of others. And that's why they have tried to hedge their bet. Yeah, we signed this agreement, so I'm not going to break it. But, you know, it, there, and, and Modi's going to understand that he doesn't have to stand up and scream and wave the Western flag. Um, but people are talking to him, and people are going to make, make some deals with him, and he'll understand that he, it is in his interest to move to another, in another direction. Uh, but Putin is not winning in a, a global public opinion battle here at all. Okay, uh, last question, actually. I think the time is quite near, so Yuri, if you could. Okay, the, yeah, uh, the question is first, what do you think about the proposal of no-fly zone? That was the former ambassador to Ukraine's proposal to limit a no-fly zone. And the second is, uh, do you think that Putin is expecting NATO to get in, uh, involved more, that he's expecting kind of that type of action so that he actually could say, we are fighting NATO, not Ukraine? So. Tom, and then the rest of the panel. I, I've worked with um, John Herbst when he was ambassador in Kiev. I have a high opinion of him. He's a, he's a very good guy. He's a very skilled diplomat. I, I, I'm going to have to respectfully disagree with him. A limited no-fly zone to me sounds like you might be a little bit pregnant. <laughs> you know, um, targeting by definition is binary. And I don't know how you would do a limited fly zone. Um, I think if, if we were to have any sort of you know, no fly zone, that, that is escalatory. I mean, that is, and I don't think there's any consensus in NATO for this whatsoever. I think if the US and the Brits, for example, uh, Coalition of the Willing decided they would do that, I think it would, it would cause great harm in NATO, uh, in NATO councils, because it would be seen for what it is, which is escalatory. And, and there's no such thing as a, uh, an immodest or a, a limited, non-threatening, no-fly zone. You know, all the radars would be on, and every airplane in the on the sky would have to be armed. You know, and you know, quite frankly, the Russian Air Force has shown itself to be incredibly incompetent. And, you know, this is, this is you know, they've actually the Ukrainians have not done a bad job with their air defense, with their air, ground air defense systems. And so I don't see what it would really bring to us. And then I'll leave to my colleagues the question of the second question, but a good question overall. 
No, I, I absolutely agree. And, and I think it's almost overtaken by events because that, I mean, I, I, that, that notion of a limited no-fly zone that a lot of people signed on to, um, Bill Taylor and a lot of others, very, very smart people, and I think they were responding to the humanitarian crisis at the beginning, is we have to be able to do something to create a humanitarian corridor. And I confess I kind of played with that notion too, but I come, still come back to the same question. It's ultimately you have to be able to shoot down somebody in the sky, and that somebody is going to be a Russian airplane. But that's an act of war. And that's an act of war. And you can say it, and you and you can claim that you know you can you can say I'm 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 essentially trying to protect hospitals or whatever, and you're not obeying the rules. But you know there's no court up here that's gonna gonna decide this. You're simply to get to your second question. I think giving Putin exactly the excuse that he wants, as we said before, we don't think this is a proxy war between NATO and Russia. He does. And this would simply validate his vision. Um, but I think now, given the state of the war, given the fact that, that, that Putin has essentially stopped trying to take Kyiv, stopped trying to do much in the West, and it's in the East, um, then I think the notion of a human, I mean, the humanitarian quarter uh, is, is, is pretty wide open right now if you just get people out of the steel mill in Mariupol. You know, one possibility that, and I didn't see anybody talk about this early on in the conflict when they were discussing this no-fly zone, was the idea of, of simply the use of passive measures, electronic warfare, electronic countermeasures, uh, electronic counter countermeasures. And I, I would just suggest... These could be interpreted as, as, as hostile acts of war, but I think from a very, very selfish American perspective, I'm saving those for me. I'm not going to show the Russians what I can do. I can't. I just can't. So either way, I think in the end of the day, you, you, don't, you don't have an option as with the conditions as they currently stand. And like you said, it's OBE at this point. It's overtaken by events. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So I would like to thank the panel, if, uh, if we could give them a, a clap. And uh, thank you for your attention, for your questions. And I hope to see you all at one point uh, at the Masaryk University, at the Faculty of Social Studies, um, uh, either as a, mm, some students or teachers or guests. So thank you all. <laughs>